Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your last stand out of this place unless you repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Lord, this is your word. And Jesus, those are your words, specifically written to us today, to the church then, to the churches of all time, Lord. So we ask that you administer your word to our hearts. Give us something to apply in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. It says, Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which you will take place after these things. That is the theme verse of the book of Revelation. And he's talking about there when he says, write the things that you've seen. When he saw in chapter 1, he saw the revelation. He saw Jesus Christ, the picture of Jesus Christ. And now in chapter 2, he's going to write the things that are the church age, the seven churches that represent all seven churches through all time. And then when you get to chapter 4, these 2 and 3 are the church the things that are now. Chapter 4 is the things that are to come. So the seven churches are those that are. He writes his first letter to this church. Now, there's a four-fold application to these things. It's applied locally to all the seven churches. It's applied ecclesiastically. Anyone who cares about the church and needs to study these these churches with the problems and the difficulties and the challenges the churches face. And so the church is addressed in these letters. And then to apply these things, these letters to these churches personally in your own life. Let him who has an ear hear individually. And then these letters are, are applied prophetically. The church history throughout until the end of the age, which is, we believe is now. There's also a four-fold pattern, four things, a pattern in this. In each one of these letters, there's positive affirmation, you know, there's positive things said to each church, and to each church there is a corrective exhortation, and then to each church there's eternal motivation, and then to each church, a partial revelation of Jesus to each church. So each letter has those things, the first four I mentioned, and these four things. And each church's name means something special. And we'll see that as we look at the churches. Now there's three things about these messages to these churches. That is this. Those were seven historic churches at that time. When these letters were written uh, by, you know, penned by John from Jesus Christ to the seven churches at that time. The seven churches that were in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey today. And number two, it's representative of these letters are representatives of all the churches of all ages. Relevant to the church today as well as of all time. And thirdly, these churches provided 
it, just a, a great example of the history of the church. As we look at it, and then right when we finish the last letter, I'm going to go into the seven time periods each one of these churches represents. And actually the church that we're in right now, the last seventh letter, uh, you know, the, the church today is that last hundred years. We'll see how that plays out. Prophetically, because it's a, a prophetic picture. Now, we just read this first letter, the message to the church in Ephesus. Now, when you study the book of Acts, you are studying the church age. Because you know, the book of Acts is not, isn't, isn't finished. It never finished, the book of Acts. Okay? And the church age is what we call the apostolic, apostolic age. Churches are planted. The time when the disciples of, of Jesus ministered there in the book of Acts. And now we're fast forwarding, forwarding to the end of that apostolic age. Okay? The, the, where the, the apostles, that their age then, where they ministered these letters. John is the last apostle alive. So it's the end of that age, that apostolic age, okay? So it's the end of the first century. It's about 90, 95 AD. And Jesus gives John and this incredible vision in, in uh, the first chapter of Revelation. And then the theme verses, you know, Revelation 119, which we look at. And now we're going to look at the things that are ours. As he writes to these seven churches, the seven different churches. He's going to say what he, he sees and thinks about the church. And the letters all follow the same format. He'll say, to the angel of that church, when he starts every letter out, to the angel of that church. And then, then he describes himself, that he's Jesus, who he is, based on chapter 1. He tells them that he knows what you are doing. He tells them the good things they're doing. And then he, he tells them the things that need correction. And then he tells them what they need to do. Then he tells them to listen to him and a, and a promise to those who will listen. So each letter has those things in it. Now, this particular church, Ephesus, Ephesus, Paul ministered there for quite a while. Okay? And it was a leading church in the world. So he starts off there in verse 1. He says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus, Ephesus write these, write, these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now we see in the last verse in chapter 1 what that means. When you read the last verse, it says, As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my, in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we see we what he's talking about right there, this, you know, the explanation that he's writing in the Bible. And then, when he says to the angel, if you look at this, does this mean that each church has an angel? Well, you know, maybe not. You see, the word angel means messenger. So, to the, to the angel of this church, it, it, it means a message. It could be a man, it could be a pastor, it could be a leader of the church, or it could be an angel that he gives this message to. Now, it's a very serious position to be in, the one who's going to give this message to the church. You know, that's uh, a serious place to be when, when you're sharing the things of the Lord. Because in James 3.1 it says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So if this message is to that pastor of that church, the leader of that church, to give it to him, you know, he's, he's under that stricter judgment there. So then in verse 2, he, now he's going to speak to him. He says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and are not. And you found them to be false. You know, Jesus sees everything. And so what he's saying here is, you know, I know your deeds. And he tells of the good qualities. That, you know, they're told that they persevere, that they, they have patience. That they're hardworking believers. If you notice here, when he says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. 
you know, when you read this, you go, you know something about this. Jesus knows that it is, that they are hard-working believers. The ministry isn't easy. Being a believer in Jesus Christ and serving the Lord Jesus Christ, it is, it is not something fun to do in spare t- your spare time. It's hard, but it also should be joyous as you do. But it's hard work. I can tell you that. It is hard work. You know, sometimes, you know, as a pastor, I am wiped out after Sunday mornings, you know, and go home. I remember, I take a nap every Sunday. You know, when I miss it, I'm going to be on the night, you know. I take, I take a nap. And then Mondays, you know, I take my day off. You know, this fellow named Dehan, he said this one time. He said, to come to Christ costs you nothing. To follow Christ costs you something. To serve Christ costs you everything. So Jesus says that he takes note of it. He sees. He understands. You know, when you're serving the Lord and you're being persecuted and you're working and you're just, you know, sharing the things of Jesus, Jesus sees. He will reward you. He knows it's hard. And he tells him, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. And that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those. You know, you can test. It must be people who read the word and understand the word. You put to test those who call themselves apostles. I mean, we should do that today. You know the Bible says in Matthew 10, 39, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And this is a church that you can see to do that. And, and when you serve the Lord, it says in Matthew 10, 42, and, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Jesus sees. He sees that they don't tolerate evil men at the same time. Being pure. They know what it is to be pure. They know what it is to live uprightly. And they don't tolerate evil men. They deal with them. And those who were in the body of Christ, they confront them in love. So you know what? You can be happy. You can live rightly. Because God knows what's best. And then to test those who call themselves apostles. False Christians. To test them. Are they really of God? You know, I, I shared with you guys before, I, you know, I remember the first apostle, proclaimed apostle I met. 1979 or 1980, I think it was 1980. And this guy came into town and he was an apostle, an apostle. And, and he expected us to bring him into our houses and feed him and give him a place to live and to take care of him while he went to the beach and worked for the Lord. And he did. But we lived in Lake Tahoe, it's this beautiful place. And, there, and he comes and he goes and lays on the beach. He's with the Lord. And he expected us to take care of him because he was an apostle. A special place, a little bit better than everybody else. That special office. Yeah, you know what we told him? We told him to dust, dust the feet up on the outside of our door as you go on your way. And we told him also, you know, we're doing the. But he, you know, it took a little while to get to that point. He hung around, around for, I don't know, a month or two. All summer, I think he was there. Not just accepting it because they quote God's word. Not just accepting it because they say, you need to repent. Thus saith the Lord God. Oh, with the, with, then I remember we had a, you know, people would say this man was a prophet that came. He wrote a lot of good music that we, we would listen to. and He was doing a concert in a, in a in a village next to us, or, or you know, about an hour from us. And the people that were in that, that town uh, and in that church, they called us up because they knew that Calvary Chapel of Truckee had people in it who were worshipers. We just love to worship the Lord. And in his town, I guess they you know, were learning that they really, there was not a lot of worshipers, there were a lot of song singers. He called me up and said, Would you bring your people down from your church to come down and and worship, you know, just worship the Lord so our people can just see people doing it. Uh, not that we would do it, we would just worship the Lord and they see it and we would catch, you know, we would catch on. So we did. We went down there and said, come early. And 
and, and you can hang out with the musician, you know. He was a big, big vineyard worship leader. And everybody knew. And everybody was doing his music. And come to lunch and meet him. And so we did. We went to lunch and we met him and talked to him. He was a nice guy and this and that. And we hung out all day with him and his band. And, you know, it was kind of cool. You know, it was kind of fun. And then that night came and, and then, you know, there was the time of worship. And we were thinking, we worship the Lord. And then he went into, he was going to prophesy over people. And he had people were just, just, you know, kind of waiting for that word from the Lord. And he came and prophesied over my wife. I think he did it from the pulpit. I'm not sure. How, I can't remember exactly how he did it. But, you know, while we were having lunch with him, you know, he learned about our lives. <laughs> and, and Anna had shared with him, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, writing songs right now. I just feel like, you know, I'm just, just right now I'm not, not a lot of going on. Something he shared with him. He prophesied. There's a, you know, I can't remember Anna or whatever. No, I was sitting down. Huh? I was sitting down. You were sitting down and get it from the pulpit. Yeah. I didn't go. Huh? I didn't go. No, you didn't go out. No, she didn't go out. He just did it from the pulpit and, and pointed and really pointed her out and said, was she struggling with struggling with uh this and that? It made her look like God told her that. Mm -hmm. People didn't know you how this afternoon. We were like, ooh. Good He was a false prophet. It was sad because we really liked him. We liked his music. And then we had some other experiences with him also. But these guys in this church, they checked that out. You know, we did too. We, we, had a, we, we took people from our church before to a whole, to a worship thing, and then they started shaking the bacon, I call it. Slaying the spirit. Shaking bacon. Going down. And then when the little kids started going down, he, he, all the little kids come forward and they're knocking them all down. We, our whole world got up and walked out. All, all people from our church said, you know what, we're not, we're not. We walked out of the local church down here when that happened. You know what, I'm not standing here and being supporting this. I'm leaving mean, because I know God's word. So they were hard working in the spirit. And they persevered. And they didn't tolerate evil men and, the, and apostles. They, they found them to be false in what they said they were. And so from all outward appearances, this church was doing good. It was looking good. It was doing the things that it was supposed to do. It looked good from the outward side. You know, and he says there in verse 3, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. And, you, and you've been doing all these things and you haven't got wasted. You haven't worn out. You haven't burnt out. What a great example they are. Then he says one word in verse 4. He says, but. Oh, no. But. I have this against you. You have left, left your first love. The key ingredient. You've left your first love. You're doing all these works. You're doing all these things. But you're not doing it for me. Maybe, maybe they're doing them for, you know, so that they look good. They're doing them because they know they're supposed to. They're just doing them because they're supposed to do them, but they're not. Their heart isn't there anymore. I see people in my life. I, I see that in people at times. You know, I pray for them. They've lost their zeal for the Lord. You know, they're, they've lost their first love. They just need to come back. They need to come back. How'd that happen? How does that happen? Who knows? I don't know how it happened here. Maybe, maybe money in someone's life. Or maybe a relationship with somebody. Or sin in their life happened in their life. Because we know other things, anything that would take the place of that in your life. You lost your first love. You put something else first in your life. We know that stuff gets in the way. We know, as it says in 1 Timothy 6, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Things of the world, 
In 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Maybe the things of the world have taken the place of the first love of God. Or maybe it's family, putting family first. Putting someone before God. A spouse, a loved one, a child, a mother or a father. Put God first. Matthew 10, 37, Jesus said it himself, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. For those of you who are single, listen to by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 7, 33 and 34, he says, but he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and the wife her husband. Spouses can be a distraction from the Lord, is what it's saying. Since there's a difference between a wife and a virgin, the unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now that's not a bad thing, okay? that a, you know, a husband and a wife take care of each other. But if you're single, you have more time to serve the Lord and not worry about cooking dinner for your husband. You can serve the Lord. Jesus first. That's what this is saying to us. When Jesus is first, your family will be better off. Now you can do all these things. You can have husbands and wives and you can, you know, and you can you have things in the world, it's just don't put them before the Lord. Put him first. Well, you know what? He, he tells them this, but he gives them a solution to the problem. He says in verse 5, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place. Unless you repent. Now that doesn't sound good. I want that lampstand removed out of its place. He's talking to the church here. He's talking to the individuals, but the church, this, your lampstand, this church is going to be removed. You need to repent. Remember where you've fallen. Remember how it was when you were first saved. Do the first stuff again. Get your eyes off of things. Repent. You know, I love the story. I think it's, it's in Kings. I can't remember which one. Chapter 5 or 6. First or second Kings, chapter 5 or 6. <clears throat> when Elisha was the prophet, and, and the sons of the prophet, you know, they had a school of prophets or something at that time where they all went to school, and it was getting really, really crowded there. And they said to Elisha, Hey, can we go, go down by the river and build some more houses, some dwellings for ourselves? Because it's getting too crowded here. So can we go down there and, and build the place where we can be? And I said, sure. And he went down with him. And there was the one son of the prophet who was down there, and he was he was chopping the tree, you know. He borrowed an axe from someone, and he wham, wham, whoa! The axe said, woo, kerplunk! Lands in the water. Oh, no! Oh, and he's freaking out because he borrowed it. He didn't borrow it. He didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't his. So he, Elijah, Elijah, help! So Elijah comes over. And Elijah says, where to go in at? Where's the place? It's right here. And so Elijah takes a stick. Which, when you we look at it, if I ever, you know, if you ever heard me share this, it were, the stick represents the cross, the wood. Goes in the water, and the axe head rises to the top. Now, it could have went, meow, and landed on the axe head, but it didn't. The son of the prophet had to reach down and grab it. He had to do something about it. And, you know, the, 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 the teaching on it that I do is, is that axe head is 
for us represents for us the power of the acts. Like the Holy Spirit is the power in our lives. Something God gives us, you know, we, it, it's not ours. It, it, you know, we don't own the Holy Spirit. He owns us. It's a power in our life. And we can go through, and we can be going through with the world, doing the things, and then one day, you know, the Spirit is, is not there anymore for us. You know, we're just, something is wrong in our lives. Just like the axe head goes, that guy could have taken that axe head and still run around going, boom, boom, and hit, hit, hit trees with that piece of wood, but it wouldn't cut anything. Because that was the cutting edge. Like the Holy Spirit is the cutting edge in our lives. And that, in the prophecy, what happened? Where did it go in? Now see, he had to know, those of you who, those of you who, probably most of you don't, we came from the mountains, the snow, we chopped wood. And when you chop wood, you know when your axe handle is getting loose. And you don't let it fly off. You soak it in water, the wood. You soak it in water, and then you let it dry out. You put a little wedge in it, and when it, when it dries out, it, it snugs it up again. You do something about it before it happens. You don't let it just go. And we know that what water represents in the Bible is the word. To Wash yourself with the Word constantly so your accent, so the Spirit doesn't get dull in your life. You know? It doesn't get dull in your life. And when, it, when that happens and that power is gone, you need to go back and you need to look. What happened? What did it happen? What do I need to repent of? So I can get sharp again. And these people lost their first love. They were running around with Bam, they're, they look like they're doing all the work. They're doing all the stuff, but they got an axe handle with no axe head on it. And he says, remember from where you have fallen and repent and to do the deeds you did at first. Go back to that place. Go back. Do the first stuff. Get your eyes off the stuff and look at Jesus. Be grateful again. Lord, you saved me. Remember when you were first saved? Lord, and the love you have for the Lord, and the excitement you have for the Lord, why don't you have it today? I mean, I'm not saying you, you guys don't. But to stay in that place, or else, He's going to take the light away from you. That's what He's saying. The lampstand's going to be taken away from you. The light is going to go out. When your lamp goes bad, you usually go have to go get another one. And he, he says that to him there. He says, Or else I am coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. But, he says in verse 6, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, how do you say it? Which I also hate. You know, I'm not exactly sure who they are, but a couple of ideas on who these Nicolaitans are. Uh, the word Nikos means conquest, and the other part, laity, Nikos laity, conquest of the people of the church. The Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, conquerors of the people. Now. There was, in the second century AD, there was a whole group of people that followed these teachings. They were followers of Nicholas. And Nicholas, who Nicholas was, he was in the, the sixth chapter of Acts. And he got off on his doctrine, and he led people astray. He led people into wickedness and immorality. And they went because of his credentials. He was a deacon in the church, and so people thought, well, he must be of God. You know, we'll just follow. You know, Hal Lindsey, who wrote the book, The Late Great Planet of Earth, and Hal Lindsey has a program on, uh, I think, some Christian stations, maybe even TDN. He says this about Nicholas. He says, 
The Galatians are false teachers who claim the actions of your body did not affect your spirit, so go out and sin up a storm. The Galatians. Hey, you're saved. It's not going to affect your body. You will do whatever you want. That's the teaching of the Galatians. And Jesus says, you hate the deeds of them, and I do too. Now, so that's one view of them. There's another view of them, the Galatians, uh, again, conquest of the people, is this, that maybe it was those people who thought they were more spiritual than other people. Well, I read the word every day at 7, 9, and 11. And I pray for an hour a day. And I have the gift of tongues, and you don't. You know, and the regulations for those people thought they were better than, than other people. I have the gifts, and you don't. You know, you see that today. You know, I, I remember when, yeah, as a younger Christian, you know, there were those ministries out there. You didn't have to get the tongues. Well, maybe you're not saved. And there was that, that air of, well, we're a little better. You need to get the gifts. You know, I remember the people praying for, I had to get the tongues before I met these people, so for me. But I watched people that didn't have the gift of tongues be, feel belittled with people standing over there praying, you know, and shaking. Hey, just say, just just let your tongue go, you know, do all this stuff. And, you know, my friends, I, I had a couple friends that just made noises to keep people off the bat. <laughs> blue, 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 blue. <laughs> See, you got the gift, you got the gift, you know. And I talked to them later, I don't have the gift, I just said it because they're freaking me out. <laughs> happens all the time. You, you say anything, you get them off your bat. Because they don't, they don't give up, and you need to have the gift. You're, you're not filled with the spirit unless you have the gift of tongues. Billy Graham never had the gift of tongues. And I gotta let more people learn than anybody I know. I mean, even Paul and we, and we did, everybody, you know. He was very good at the tongues. So he wasn't filled with the Spirit. Maybe he wasn't even saved. Is that right? So that's another view. I'm not exactly sure which one the relation but they're both bad things. People that think they're more spiritual than other people, you know, or people that say, hey, it's good to sin. It doesn't affect your bodies. You know, it's a spiritual thing. Well, the Lord does say this now. It's an encouragement. He has an encouragement to the church. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, he says that when he says, he who has an ear, well, we all got ears. But he's saying, you know, like, open the eyes of our heart, open the, you know, the ears of the Spirit, that you, you hear what he's saying, that's what he, do you understand spiritually what he's saying? You as a, because it, a lot of people would hear this and think nothing of it. Like, oh, I don't know. It would mean nothing to me. But when you hear it and you understand, let him who has ears, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to him who overcomes, the one who says, repents, turns back, goes back, says, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. You know, I don't know about you guys. I'm eating from that tree. There's, there's this tree in heaven. We're going to eat from that tree. We're going to eat all we want. And we're not going to eat fat. Have an ear to hear. Are you born again? Do you have those ears? If you're saved, you have that ear. You see, this is a message from the Holy Spirit to every one of us in this room. Something here for us. To search our hearts. To make sure that this church isn't us. But if it is, if we hear and we respond to this call, take it into your heart. And you will be eating from that tree in eternity. That's a promise. The tree of life that we will see, that we see later in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. Go ahead and turn there. We'll end with this. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. And I believe that's the tree we'll be eating from. And there's a different fruit every month. Wow. You know it's not like us here. Mango season comes and it goes. And then we have to wait until it comes back again. And it'll be mangoes one month, be bananas one month, and you know what I mean? I don't know what it's there. I, it, it, whatever food's there is going to be. It, and I remember talking to somebody one time and, and you know, discussions about eating from that tree. And, you know, think, think about things in the tree. What's it going to be like? What, and I remember, I can't remember what we got from or heard <coughs> But there's this thought of every time you eat of the fruit, you gain more knowledge of God. Oh, so you want to eat more and you get more knowledge of God. You know, I don't know how true that is or not, but and we're going to be gaining knowledge of the Lord throughout eternity. We're never going to get bored of learning about God and who He is and His love. It's going to be eternal bliss. We are not going to get bored. See, we can't understand that. Well, same old tree of fruit, man. It's October again and we're going to have to eat Sour sap. That ain't sour. Yep. It's November. Then I have to eat apples. Bummer. No, it won't be that way. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And Jesus is going to be there. So that's the first letter that he writes to the church, to us. And so, Lord, we thank you for the encouragement of this word, Lord. We thank you of how we can see in our own lives and where we can get busy doing the stuff of ministry and, and serving you, Lord, and going and going and going. And, but forget about you and who you are. Lord, I pray for every one of us <clears throat> in this room and everyone who is a part of this church, Calvary Chapel here in St. Mike, that, Lord, we would not lose sight of you. That we would remember, Lord, our first love. And I pray for those who've lost it, Lord, and I believe some have. That, Lord, they will repent. They'll have ears to hear your spirit, Lord, and they will come back to you and surrender their hearts and their lives to you, Lord, so that they can eat of that fruit on that day when we're in eternity, Lord. So have your way in each life. Accomplish what you desire to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let, let me throw, ask you guys a question here.